page 25. What is apostolic ministry? Apostolic ministry. And I want to point out an amazing guy. Barnabas. Now, at the beginning, the church sent him out. But in Acts 13, we see the Holy Spirit sending him out. And there's a very big difference. And, uh, and uh, there's some amazing people I want to list here, with, uh, along with Barnabas. He, he, uh, he went and found Saul who became Paul. He found Mark. From where we got the gospel. Uh, who else? Um, well, let's go ahead and list this guy. <laughs> now, what do those guys all have in common? Barnabas, Saul. Now, I don't know about Mark, but I know this guy, and this guy, and this guy. All three of them were single. They were not married. I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 4.15. First Corinthians 4.15. These guys are amazing, amazing apostolic leaders. First Corinthians 4.15. Yep. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I've sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Wow. What we find, Barnabas is an amazing guy. He gets sent out from Jerusalem to go visit all these new churches that are coming up. As uh, Many people are coming to Christ. The church is coming up everywhere. So Jerusalem sends out Barnabas. He's a, he's a major leader in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. So they send him out. And, uh, but when he's all done visiting these churches in these towns, then he comes to himself and he says, wait a minute, what happened to this guy Saul? He was an amazing guy. This is 14 years later, after Saul's conversion. Saul is converted, he goes off into the desert. Nobody hears from him for like 14 years. And then Barnabas says, what happened to Saul? This was an amazing guy. And he goes searching for him, and he finds him, and he brings him to Antioch. Huh? And um, uh, in, uh, let's turn to Acts 13. Acts 13. Uh, verse 1. Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, uh, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius, with Herod uh, the, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas, and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucus, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. 
And they go on. Let's see. And uh, look at verse 13. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to uh, Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So it's amazing. Uh, Barnabas goes looking for Saul. He sees something in Saul. He brings him to Antioch, and he began, they began to preach and teach together in what? As teachers and prophets. They're teachers and prophets. When the Holy Spirit says, now I'm sending them out, they are now, now they're prophets and what? Teachers over here, this list. But now as they're sent out, they move out as apostles, being sent by the Holy Spirit. As they began to move out, they're ministering together. And there comes a point where, where Saul begins uh, to preach very strong. And when Saul suddenly begins to preach very powerful, Barnabas does something very unique. He steps back and lets Paul go. And that's when Saul becomes Paul. And that's when Barnabas says, okay, that's the guy I'm looking for. Barnabas is a most amazing man. See, the Bible says there are 10,000 preachers, but there's very few fathers in the kingdom of God. This is where you see somebody who has a gift and a call, and you say, come, join me. And as you minister together, you're ministering together because you're trying to help them to launch. And when they launch, you step back. Go, man, go. Huh? Now, what happened when I'm also traveling with my translators? We're traveling together, and there comes a moment where they've been preaching and praying and prophesying and ministering together with me, and they say, Brother Mark, I, I, I don't want to travel with you anymore. I want to stay in this place. I see this is a good place. I can see what God is doing. I want to do this. What do I do? I step back and I say, God bless you, go. Why? Now I can turn around and find somebody else to come alongside and they launch into what God has for them. See what happens? They're doing the same thing as me. Now they realize I've got something greater I can do. And they step into that without me. And they begin to do their ministry. And I step back and I say, go, go, go. They just launched. That's what fathers do. They want their sons and daughters to move into what God has for them. I do not want them to stay home. I don't want them to stay with me. I want them to move into what God has for them. And then I can grab somebody new and launch them. That's how I think. Now, what's amazing is Barnabas launches Saul who becomes Paul. And Mark, he's traveling with them. Now here's a point I want to make. The difference. There's Paul, Barnabas, and John. Now, when they run into a problem, huh? Mark, who's been sent out by the authority of the church, says, man, this is hard. I don't like this. And what do you mean, Paul and his party? Huh? Paul and his party. This is no party. This is serious business. <laughs> I don't know what was wrong with Mark, but he does not like what is happening, and he quits and goes home. Now, here's the difference. Paul and Barnabas are beaten. They are thrown in prison. They are left in prison. They're dead. They are shipwrecked. These two men suffer terribly. And they cannot be stopped. That is the difference of going out under the authority of man 
First is going out under the authority of God. There's a big difference. And there you see it. People can argue with me, I don't care. I just know what I know. I've seen it and I'm done with it. End of subject. Everyone has to know their call that comes from God. It cannot come from man. Human reasoning will get you nowhere except religious arguments. So, again, here's what's fascinating. Later, Barnabas is traveling with Paul, and Barnabas says, you know, that Mark is very good. I want this guy to come in because God really has something for him. And Paul says, no way, not that guy. And Barnabas chooses. Barnabas, he's the big man who chooses. To say, if I have to choose to travel with Paul or to take Mark, I choose who? Mark. Yes. Why? Paul's already going. Why two big guns together? No, you go that way. I'll take this young guy. I'll get this guy launched. Paul and Barnabas has already done his job. He's already stepped back. He knows this is my son. Saul is my son. Go. Take your guys and go. I'll take this guy and raise him up. This is, this is an amazing man. He is not fighting for power and position. He is fighting to equip Mark. This is not a power struggle. This is not a power struggle. This is a love struggle. Now, here's what's interesting. Barnabas takes Mark, and today we have the Gospel of Mark. Now, who all are disciples of Barnabas? Huh? <laughs> you guys, who are the disciples of Barnabas? Paul and Mark. I think this guy knows what he's looking at. <laughs> <laughs> One fourth of the Gospels and most of the New Testament came from these two guys. I think Barnabas knew what he was looking at. This is what we really can call a father in the faith. There is no example of, Mar of Barnabas fighting for power and position. Many people use this story. Well, Barnabas and Paul were fighting, so even godly men. No, 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 no. It wasn't for power and position like we fight today. It was not that. It was love that he had for Paul and for Mark. It was a love issue, not a power and position. So, now here's what's interesting. Look at Paul. Paul goes out. And what? He's been trained by Barnabas. Now let's just think of the sons Let's just say, who all traveled with Paul? Let's just think of some. Who? Titus. Titus. Who else? Uh, um, who else? Um, Apollos. No, nope, not Apollos. Not yet. Come on, there's another one here. Huh? Timothy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Timothy. And there, there's, uh, oh. There's one more, isn't there? Paul and? Simon? Simon. Yeah. Simon. Silas. Yes. Silas. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you got, I knew it. <laughs> okay. Now just think of these guys. These guys actually are apostles. What? These guys are also raised up as apostles. Now here's something funny. As they're traveling together, Titus is assigned to what church? Titus says, I want to stay in this church. Which one was it? Ephesus? Oh. Which one was, was Timothy? Ephesus. Ephesus. 
Timothy is assigned to Ephesus. And mm -hmm. Ephesus becomes a mega church of 30,000 people. And he's an apostolic leader. Apostolic leader. Titus, what church does he go to? Corinth. Corinth. Really? So Paul learns, like Barnabas, to be able to say, Silas, come. Titus, come. He sees Timothy and he says, Timothy, you've got to come with me. I see something good in you. See, this is prophetic. He can see, you're the guy, you come. You, you're the one, you come. This is also seeing with prophetic eyes to see what God has for them and to help them launch. There's 10,000 preachers, but very few fathers and mothers in the kingdom of God. See, this school, this school is really helping us to train and equip to what? Become mothers and fathers in the kingdom of God. That's really what this school is about. It's apostolic school. It's a prophetic school. It's a school of the Spirit. Learning how to see, hear, and obey God. Yeah? Wow. <clears throat> oh my, Barnabas. Oh my. Now you guys. The apostolic is really developing your fathers and mothers in the kingdom of God. Well, the same with the prophets. They also move in that role. We're on page 26. Oh my. You know what? I, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you guys. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I would read something really hard. Now, Paul, people say today, well, there's no apostles today. Who says? People say there's no signs and wonders and miracles. They happen all the time. The church is looking for the Antichrist. They're not looking for the return of Christ. Interesting. Our eyes are not looking for the glory of God. They're looking for rumors, wars, famine. They're not looking for Christ. Actually, the Bible says the glory of God is covering the earth. Where? Go join the move of God. So let's look at this. 1 Corinthians 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Now he's writing to the Corinthians. If I am not an apostle to others, yet uh, doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. When I came to Corinth, there was nothing here. Now look at this huge church. Look at this movement that's here. Look at the pastors, the leaders, the evangelists that are coming here. Signs and wonders and miracles. Many things happening. It, it's all happened because I came. I, indeed, I am your father. I am an apostle to you. Three, my defense to those who examine me in this do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? See, the other apostles are traveling with their wives in these churches. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Why do we have to be tent makers? We're the ones who started you. You guys, 
Here's a painful experience. Paul planted this church. No, 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 no. Let me rephrase that. That's not a correct term. He's the one who evangelized this area and raised it up with signs and wonders and miracles. The church has been raised up. Now, that church is not supporting Paul. You guys, the church that he raised up is not supporting him. But they're raising money to bring Peter and his wife and the notable apostles from Jerusalem to there. And they get free housing and food and transport and we'll send them back to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas have to work because they're not supporting them. You guys, is that painful? Is that painful? Is that painful? That's painful. And yet, <laughs> he bears it. Who ever goes to war at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk and of the, of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man? Or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law, you shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? No, it's us. Verse 12. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, mm -hmm. but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. this, this, this chapter, 1 Corinthians 9, as you read it, it is really talks about the suffering, the heart suffering of apostolic ministry. Mm -hmm. It's not what you think. If you, if you read <laughs> books in America, you will think apostles are the big guys with all the big ministries under them because they have a big office and a big car and their own airplane. It's not true. This paints a whole nother picture of a very hard road for the sake of the gospel to go where it's never been before. And others will come in behind you and live very well. But you yourself, baby beans and posho. <laughs> Every day. It's like, when do I get to have pork? When do I get to have sheep? When do I get to have goat? When do I get to have beef? No. Someone else will eat that. So, uh, <laughs> so you learn to endure. So, um, uh, the, the, the prophets, the prophets, again, prophets are people <laughs> who, who really suffer in many ways. You see, all the way through the, the Old Testament, they're really suffering. In the New Testament, actually, when you read the book of Acts, you will see how the gospel advanced with power and force because of prophetic ministry. God showing them, giving them visions and dreams and speaking to them. Even angels coming and opening the door for them to go do what God tells them to do. Okay? This is amazing. It's prophetic. We move in the Spirit. Huh? We move in the Spirit. Uh, uh, Wow, there's so many stories here. Uh, whew, so much. You know, it's amazing. And in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about all these different ministries that the Holy Spirit wants to do with us. These are ministries that move with signs and wonders and miracles. And let's turn to... 
First Corinthians chapter 14. So there's many ministries in 1 Corinthians 12. And then 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love. Love. Love is the motivator. Everything is done out of love. If we don't have love, it just doesn't matter. We become hard, cruel, harsh, <laughs> not loving and kind, but we're doing the ministry. Doing the ministry, and we do it harshly. But love, and truly, if we love, from love, from love, comes faith. From love comes hope. The greatest is love. 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 We always stir love, more love, more love, more love, more love. If we have love. And, uh, and then, when we're saturated with love, uh, then we, we come to 1 Corinthians 14. And 1 Corinthians 14 is all about tongues and prophecy. Tongues and prophecy. And it's very amazing to me. When we understand what tongues and prophecy is, when we read 1 Corinthians 14, we should be fanning the fire of tongues and prophecy in the church. Because that's where uh, vision, direction, power, conviction, all of these things come. And it says that if a sinner comes into your church, see, the church is not designed to house sinners. Mm. The church are the sons and daughters of God worshiping their father. We do not adjust ourselves to sinners. Sinners should come into the presence of God and adjust themselves to God. Huh? And prophecy, when it is functioning in the church prop properly, it brings conviction. You know, tongues is for the unbeliever to come and say, wow, God is in this place. Mm -hmm. Prophecy is for the believer to say, wow, God is speaking to me. Huh? It's amazing. And the, and the unsaved will come into this place and say, wow, God is in this place. Whoa. God is in this place. This is a wild place. Now, <laughs> if, if these things are truly functioning properly, you, you will actually have a flow of the Spirit moving out of your church. The flow of God will move with them as they go into people's homes. And that's where you'll see signs and wonders, miracles. I remember in Mongolia, <clears throat> I came into this church, it's quite dead, and we just began to just invite the presence of God, Holy Spirit come, fire, fire, fire. And it was amazing. It was really amazing. Suddenly the people in the church began to see and hear and obey God. Miracles began to happen. Amazing miracles. Where people would be at home and the Lord would say, go to the hospital. Someone is coming in on an ambulance. And they would put on their coat. They would go to the ambulance or go to the hospital right when the ambulance is coming in. They came in, this lady, she came in and she prayed for the child that was on there. The child got up, healed. The, parent, the, the parents then, they came to church because what God had done for their child. They got saved. There was many of these kinds of stories. They were amazing stories. And the church began to grow. It doubled within three months. It was packed out. It's like, how do we get the more people in? The, the church just started exploding because what was happening. Then I went away. And when I came back several months later, 
the church was down in size and everybody was just quiet again. And I could say, oh, what happened? I says, what happened here? You know? <laughs> and he said, we don't want an event-driven church. Event? You mean where God is doing signs, wonders, and miracles. You don't want that. Wow. And by the way, it wasn't the pastor doing it. It was the people doing that. And trust me, their testimonies were living. They, they were so excited. They were excited about leading people to Christ and bringing them. It was, it was a phenomenal time. And, uh, oh my. Oh. You know, when the presence of God is there, there will be tongues, there will be prophecy, there will be deliverance, there will be healing. There will be all of these amazing things. There will be salvation. We talked about when the flood of the Holy Spirit comes in, there will start being salvation, healing, deliverance. God will start calling people. He start giving people to do miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations. And even administration. To understand even this one, God gives someone a gift of administration. What is that? Is that to control what God is doing? No. It's to help say, oh, okay, how can we put things together to help move this thing? To help things stay coordinated so people can work together to move to the next level. It's not designed to bring things down, and bring control and order. It's, it's meant to orchestrate, to help things to move orderly forward. This is an amazing gift. He can fan the fire or he can squelch the fire. So, so we got... <laughs> A minute here, but let's just do this. Let's just stop just a minute. Just put out your hands. Put out your hands. You know, for the apostolic, the prophetic, the evangelist to really move powerfully and effective, he needs to move in the power of the Holy Spirit for signs and wonders and miracles and healings. These things. Just put out your hands. <laughs> oh my. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Whew. Lord, we want to <laughs> receive, receive all that you have for us. We want this amazing encounter with you. Holy Spirit, you are God alone. You are God alone. You are so amazing. Even come right now in your power with your fire. Lord, I want to see signs and wonders and miracles. As a mother, father in the kingdom of God. It is a power of God that brings many sons and daughters to Christ. In Jesus' name, power of the Holy Spirit. 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 The Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I have not chosen many wise, many great, highly educated. The kingdom of God advances in power. Power. In power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. The power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I've never seen eyes open, ears open. <laughs> Jesus' name. Power of the Holy Spirit. To preach the name of Jesus and see the power of God demonstrate to bring many sons, many daughters. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. These young men, young women, to be mothers and fathers in the kingdom of God. Mothers and fathers in the kingdom of God. Power of the Holy Spirit. 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 There'll be an impartation of the power of God. Power of the Holy Spirit. Miracles in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Miracles in Jesus' name. Miracles in Jesus' name. Miracles in Jesus' name. <laughs> Miracles in Jesus' name. Gifts of healings in Jesus' name. Power of the Holy Spirit. Power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Jesus says you'll be endued, you'll be given power from on high. Power from on high. Paul says, I did not come to you with amazing, wonderful sermons. I came to you in the power and demonstration of God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Many sons, many daughters. Many sons, many daughters. When Jesus was going through the crowd, this lady reaches out and she touches his clothes. And Jesus felt the power of God go out of him. It is this power we receive in Jesus' name. Power of the Holy Spirit. Power of the Holy Spirit. Power of the Holy Spirit. To speak the name of Jesus and see demonstration of power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With Jesus, with Peter, with Paul, uh, with Barnabas, with Titus, with Timothy, with Apollos, wow, Ananias, really amazing things. In Jesus' name, your eyes are open, ears are open, hearts are open. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yeah, amen. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> More of that. <laughs> All right, we'll take another 10-minute break.